Welcome to Retail Connect 2019. I'm Carol Strohecker, Dean of the College of Design, which is the home of the University of Minnesota's Retail Merchandising Program. I am proud to lead the University of Minnesota's College of Design for many reasons, not the least of which is that we are home to a robust range of design disciplines, including retail merchandising, which is one of our largest majors. While a significant portion of retail education is focused on business, having a retail program situated within a design college at a major research university sets this program and our graduates apart. They stand out not only for their business and industry acumen, but also for their deep understanding and perspective on consumer-centered products and services. Our graduates also understand the importance of research-based design and decision-making in all facets of business, and they have a remarkably creative approach. They don't just solve problems, they generate solutions. The College of Design community is excited to share that the Center for Retail Design and Innovation, the instigation of which we announced last year, has come to life. The CRDI has leveraged industry partner support of the retail merchandising program and developed hands-on learning experiences currently underway. I am happy to tell you that we have two new industry partners, Macy's and Decor Apparel, both of whom are here tonight. Let's give them a hand. I'm proud of the team's accomplishments. Peggy Lord, the center's assistant director, will share more with you at the end of our program. As many of you know, this unique event comes to you thanks to collaborations across the College of Design, including faculty, advisory board members, student leaders, our alumni relations and advancement officers, and staff in the Department of Design, Housing, and Apparel. Also, many members of the retail industry, and many of you are here with us tonight. We're very happy to welcome you. I want to take a moment to recognize and thank a few of the key people who helped to make this event happen. Please stand as you are able when I call your names. Our planning team includes committee chairs Jamie Curtis, SVP of Brand Management at Decor Apparel, and Heather Harnish, VP of Mar Merchandising at Target. Could you please stand? There they are. Thank you. Retail Merchandising Program Director and the Director of the new Center for Retail Design and Innovation, Dr. Hey Young Kim, who you, you just saw on the big screen. There she is. Retail Merchandising Board President and alumna, Jill Hamburger. <laughs> Assistant Director of the Center for Retail Design and Innovation and Teaching Specialist, Peggy Lord. <laughs> and our stellar Director of Alumni Relations, Laurie Mulberg. Laurie's been honored by our University of Minnesota Alumni Association recently receiving high praise. Thank you, Laurie. In addition, the team works closely with our retail merchandising faculty. Would you please stand? There's Our Retail Merchandising Advisory Board members also play a, an important role, making connections and engaging many of the companies and professionals you see here tonight. The board also received the Best Team Service Award by the College of Design earlier this year. Advisory mem Board members, would you please stand?
And serving in partnership with our advisory board, I want to thank our retail merchandising student leadership board members seated up front tonight. Would you please stand so we can thank you for your important collaboration. They're headed for great things. The Retail Advisory Board and its industry volunteers play a key role in Retail Connect. The Retail Advisory Board comprises key subcommittees who support student learning and industry connections. I would like to recognize a member of our board with the Distinguished Advisory Board Member Award for his outstanding contributions to the retail program. This Retail Merchandising Advisory Board member has been exemplary, providing industry insight, connections, and resources to benefit the Retail Merchandising Program and our students. He has been involved in event sponsorship, the College of Design Career Fair, the Retail Advisory Board website, and student engagement. He's been an exceptionally active and engaged board member who gives without hesitation his time, talent, and resources to the Retail Advisory Board and the University. This year, I am honored to present this award for distinguished service to Chad Hetherington, CEO of The Stable. With that, I'll turn things over to our retail, our retail Connect event chair, VP of Merchandising at Target, Heather Harnish. Heather? Thank you, Carol. Welcome, everyone, to our ninth annual Retail Connect. We have an exciting program this evening with our keynote speaker, Mr. Marshall Cohen of the NPD Group, and panelists Julie Gugamos of Target and Cece Lee of Trendalytics, sharing their insight on the crystal ball of retail, where data, science, and experience collide. But first, I'd like to recognize and thank our sponsors. Our platinum sponsor this year is Target. One important aspect of platinum sponsorship is that it supports this program in a really big way but also it allows us to present one student with a scholarship, which is new to this year. You're gonna hear more about that later. Our gold sponsors, 3M, BioFreeze, Creative Partners Group, and The Ring. Our silver sponsors, Best Buy, Gems, and Kinneberg Management Group. And our bronze sponsors, Home Furniture, Kohl's, Martin Patrick III, Merchology, and the NPD Group. I would also like to recognize our Center for the Retail Design and Innovation Sponsors, Decor as a Gold Level Sponsor, and Macy's as a Silver Level Sponsor. Thank you. I'd also like to give, and as you can see, a long list of thank yous to the table sponsors. Blake Seed, Cora, Design Student Alumni Board, and made for retail. Deluxe, Honey Stinger, Little Potato, Medterra, Owlet, Quip, Result Alti, Rethink Water, The Bluebird Group, Tommy Tippy, The University of Minnesota Patent Law, and Watermelon Water. And finally, I would like to thank our string trio for playing their beautiful music this evening. And finally, I would also like to thank Chad Hetherington, CEO of The Stable and Retail Merchandising Advisory Board member, for all the vendor partners from The Stable that are sponsoring us this evening. The Stable has been voted four consecutive years of the best place to work by Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal. Thanks to each of you.
Next, we would like to take a moment now to announce our Retail Connect Platinum Student Scholarship winner, made possible this year through support from Target. I would like to invite Retail Merchandising Program Director, Dr. Hei Young Kim and Julie Gugamos from Target to the stage to help present this award. Hello, I'm Hei Young Kim, uh, the Program Director of Retail Merchandising. This year we are pleased to announce our first Retail Connect Scholarship recipient. This new scholarship program is made possible thanks to uh, Platinum Retail Connect sponsors, and it is named on behalf of those Platinum sponsors annually. This year, we present the Target Leadership Development Scholarship. This professional development scholarship is a $1,500 uh, travel scholarship for a student to use during the, uh, this academic year, 2019-2020 academic year, uh, for a travel to New York City for the National Retail Federation NRF Student Conference or the spring semester New York Fashion Study Tour. We had many outstanding applicants. The program faculty went through a rigorous selection process. This year's winner is someone who has demonstrated outstanding leadership in our program as the Vice President of the NRF Student Association and as one of our outstanding student leadership board members. She is an advocate for our program, demonstrating contagious passion for the retail industry. Please join me in congratulating Claire Erickson. Claire? Congratulations, Claire. In a moment, we will move to the main event, our keynote presentation by Marshall Cohen, followed by a panel discussion. In order to help you make connections at this event and have some time to discuss key learnings and develop questions for our speakers, we've included time for table talk during the presentation. We will conclude with 10 minutes of Q&A and closing remarks by Peggy Lord, Assistant Director of the New Center for Retail Design and Innovation. So, let's get started. I'd like to introduce Marshall Cohen, Chief Industry Advisor, NPD Group. Marshall is a nationally known expert on consumer behavior and definitely one of my favorites. He also specializes in trend in the retail industry. His work involves analyzing and interpreting trends, data for several retail industries and guiding top companies in long-range strategic planning. He is highly regarded in the industry, frequently quoted, and has been featured on TV programs such as Today, Good Morning America, Bloomberg TV, and radio. Please welcome Mr. Marshall Cohen. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. We've certainly got a lot to cover in a very short period of time, so I'm going to go quickly, but I'm not going to bore you with a lot of details in the numbers. A lot of what I'm going to share with you today is derived from a mass amount of data, all right? And you'll see some of it. I'm not going to take the time to, to dive into too much of it, but it really does come down to helping you guys understand where we are. We are at the crossroads. The retail industry is probably facing one of the biggest challenges in front of them. Generational differences, delivery differences, competition from places they've never seen coming and don't even understand. So it's really about understanding what can you do depending on whether you're in the work environment currently or entering the workforce shortly. What can you do to help the industry understand how to do things differently? But since we're at a university, I might as well ask you a quiz. All right? And it's really about recognizing, what do you think the answer to this is? Do you think that people who have bought from a fashion resale site, 
How many people do you think the consumers are that have said that they bought from a fashion retailer? How many of you think the answer is A? 8%. Raise your hand. Not one hand. Oh, I got one hand. How many think it's B? 11%. 11 people. That's pretty good. All right. How about C? 18%. How about 25%? Raise your hand. Whoa! That's because you guys are in the industry. Because you're fashionistas. You sit there and understand it. The answer actually is 11%. A lot less than we think. But, but, just two years ago, that number was 8%. So it's growing and growing fairly rapidly. All right? So you did OK on the first question. Let's look at the second one. How about this? How many people state that they purchased product that is described as sustainable, eco-friendly, organic, or ethical. And I'm just talking about fashion product, not food and not technology, all right? Do you think it's 8%? Raise your hand. Ah, oh, we're getting a little closer. How about 14%? Raise your hand, all right? How about 22%? Raise your hand. So far, that's the winner. And 30%? Raise your hand. Not that many. Pretty even across the board for your answers. Well, you're going to get the little secret to whenever I give a quiz, I always put the answer in the exact same spot. <laughs> so if I have another question coming up, you'll know which one the answer will be. But it's 14%. And yet again, two years ago, that number was only 8%. So it's almost already doubled in the last two years. So we're literally looking at the dynamic of how we sell and make product with the opportunity to change. And that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to talk a lot about what's going on. Just look at the way in which retailers are now being determined on what they need to offer. Anybody familiar with this Pizza Hut commercial where the guy sees a skunk jump out of the garbage can, drops his pizza, and oh, lo and behold, he can bring it in and get a new one. It's product guarantee. Consumers today expect all the products that they buy to come with some kind of insurance, some kind of guarantee. A lot of retailers and brands haven't figured that out yet, but this is where we're heading. This is where we're going. And when you start to think about it, there are some retailers in some product categories, like in the beauty categories. There are a few retailers who are actually offering product guarantees. Little known fact, and that is that some of these retailers will actually take product back within 30 days on some of the beauty products. So if you buy a product, you don't like it, you can bring it back. They don't like to tell you that in a big way, but they're offering it. So they are doing and starting to capitalize on some of the key things. And if you think about Carvana, the new used car company that's changed the way in which you purchase a car. You can buy it from the gigantic vending machine, right? Not a bad idea. Hey, just put it something in there and the car comes out. But it's really about, they also offer a seven-day test drive, product guarantee. So they're changing the paradigm within the industry to match up to consumers' thinking. This is what progressive brands and retailers need to understand. What are these trigger points that are creating this? And it's what I call the big collision, retail's big collision. We've, we've entered this point where things are banging into each other and retailers have to begin to recognize they can't keep doing the same thing. And many of the things they do, whether it be the collision with online and in-store, whether it be the collision with spending and how we're spending our money across a wider sector of categories, all right, our priorities are shifting. Our spending habits are changing, experiential not even buying tangible items and buying experiential. Probably the biggest growth to holiday in 2019 will be experiential spending. The collision with oneself, just retail is colliding within their own mix, okay? And, you know, understanding how we're changing our spending habits and we're changing our leisure time spending, all these different things are starting to change, all right? And even colliding across brands as brands try to sell direct to the consumer. So things are really changing and changing rapidly. Let me step back one second and give you the state of the retail. I'm not going to spend a lot of time to go through this because there's a lot of numbers here, but you can get this information later. But it's across the board where spending, increases in spending are happening in things outside of our traditional spending, whether it be transportation, whether it be healthcare, whether it be housing, education, all different things. Consumer sentiment is actually almost at an all-time high and certainly at pretty close to January 04, which was really high. Okay? So we're in a healthy state of mind. That's the good news. All right? When we look at dollar growth over the last couple of quarters, I'm going to go back one quarter or two quarters, and you can sit there and see, this is why you heard retail was having a tough time. Because yes, it was on a downward climb, but it was still growing. 
And, the, and a lot of the analysts, and I remember going on air talking about this, trying to say, you know, you keep trying to kill the retail business and it's not dead by any means. In fact, just because it's slowed down doesn't mean it's over. And I said, watch what happens in the next quarter. And lo and behold, what happened? It leveled off. So even though all of the other analysts and even some in my own organization were calling for this you know, big dramatic decline, it didn't happen. And the reason why I said it wasn't gonna happen is because there were no signs that it was that bad off. There were many things that were positive and growing and going, and we'll talk about a lot of those. All right? And even online, the trajectory of online shows that you have the ability to be able to, yes, online is starting to slow down. Well, that's good for stores. So we're starting to see some of those faster growth rates that online was carrying forward, slowing down and catching up. There's something called committed consumption. Committed consumption is on November 1st, before you walk out the door, you're actually going to sit there and spend money on certain products before you even go out. You've already made this. I wrote about this in a book 10 years ago. I didn't even realize how big this was gonna be. All right, and this was the list from 10 years ago. It was pretty big. Right? The list has changed. We don't necessarily buy cable and satellite anymore. We now buy different you know, entertainment components like Hulu, Spotify, things like that, Netflix. We subscribe to other things. But the subscription business is starting to become a model that retail must figure out and must embrace. So we're moving along the line and understanding what committed consumption is all about. This is new to many retail environments. And brands are trying to understand how to do that and becoming progressive. But it comes with risk. Because when you think about what's going on, 50% of subscribers to these subscription businesses actually burn out. So many of us don't last long in these. A third of them disappear after three months. And they have to find ways to keep engaging with us and get those logarithms right. That's a big challenge for traditional retail. Big opportunity for those who are just entering into the market to help understand this. Another big opportunity to understand how to use data to help understand how to make success at retail happen. And there are a few brands who are actually building their product mix alongside of this and making a success out of it. A couple different companies have done a very good job of doing that. All right. There's all kinds of other distractions that are going on and other kinds of expenditures. I'm not gonna get into the healthcare piece and I'm not gonna get into the political discussion. I'm surprised we don't hear boos and cheers and whatever. You know? But it's really about we're entering into a very interesting dynamic. Politics has now become a distraction to retail. And we can't ignore the fact that we are heading into what is now an unusual major election. Usually a major election occurs only when the president is guaranteed to change office after two terms or one term when the president has not decided to run again. But this one's an interesting one and all kinds of new rules are changing it. And it's going to be an interesting thing that happens as we move closer and closer and closer to the election. But it's also about understanding how steeped in tradition retail is. And I can't tell you the biggest opportunity I see in front of me is the younger generation's ability to be able to help us. You know, there's, <laughs> there's uh, OK Boomer. Anybody familiar with OK Boomer? Anybody hear about that? I mean, it's kind of new. The, the younger generation has declared, basically, the boomers who have created much of where we are clueless to how to solve it. And it's really very true. I'm sitting here trying to understand how do I explain to the world that we need to have work in concert in helping a lot of the decision makers understand how are we going to do the things we need to do and the things we should do. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Steeped in tradition, and let me explain what this is. For 116 years, there's this thing that they call the merchandise calendar. The merchandise calendar says that you ship swimwear into stores in the months of January and February. How many of you are going to run out and go buy swimwear in the month of January and February? Anybody? Maybe you're going on vacation. That might be the only reason you would even think about it, all right? But it's been going on for 116 years. And the thought was, well, if we sell it early, we'll sell it better. Well, that's not true. Consumers today buy what they need when they need it, and they're going to get it when they want to get it. All right, coats in the month of August, August and September. September was the hottest September on recorded history, okay? 
July was the warmest July in modern times. So it's about recognizing that, you know, we need to, do you really need a, a heavy coat at that time of the year? No. It's about understanding we've been doing certain things for so long, certain ways, we need to rethink the equation. In the hotel business, I'd speak to a couple of hotel chains, and I'm sitting there going, why do you do this when you should be doing this? A marketing opportunity and something that's better for the environment. Help the consumer and help your guests and help your brand move forward. Another easy example, outside of fashion, let's go to housewares. You go out, let's say you moved into a new apartment, you went and bought a 10-piece set of cookware, right? Well, now that you've decided you love cooking and you want to cook more, and by the way, we all are cooking more, all right, and you want to add to your collection, are you really going to run out and buy another 10-piece set? No. The next thing is it's, it's about selling through open stock, open selling. So one or two retailers have actually been very successful at creating this next paradigm about understanding how to tap into what the consumer really wants. Just two years ago, I was speaking at uh, the electronics group in um, Las Vegas, big, huge convention they would have. And it was the Consumer Electronics Show. And I remember speaking to all these major heads of all these major companies and marketing and senior executives and all these C-level executives, and I asked them, why don't they put color into the mix? And they sat there and said, nobody buys color. It's a genderless environment. You know, women don't, aren't any different than men when it comes to buying technology. And I went, boy, do you guys really have no clue. And they went out and they went from silver to a, a, a gray metal and they said, oh, look at what we did. And then this year they went out and they put red into the mix. I said, you really just have no clue. Why is it that the headphone business is one of the hottest, most successful components of all of the technology business? Isn't it ironic they come in 20 colors on each brand? They don't get it. They're not quite catching up to what's going on. In fashion, you know, it, it, it's amazing to me when I sit there and speak to the denim companies, they still keep trying to pour long, skinny, low-rise jeans into the mix. How many of you need to go out and add to another pair of low-rise, skinny jeans into your wardrobe? Anybody? I got one guy raised his hand. <laughs> okay. Well, they make them. That's not fine. But it's really about recognizing the consumer's telling us they want new, relaxed, mid-rise, high-rise, cropped jeans. They, they want something new and different. What a novel idea. Give them something that they want, okay? Here's an easy one. You know, now that everybody's cooking more and having more interest in different things that are going on in the industry, the traditional industry sells dinner plates, they sell salad plates, they sell dessert plates, they sell those little tiny cups and saucers with the little, you know, dish underneath, and who really eats like that anymore? We're making all these great fun dishes. We want fun dishes to put our fun dishes that we're cooking on to also be serving on. So it's all about recognizing, tap into what the consumer wants. My favorite example? is the knife block. This has been around for quite a while. I have one, many of you probably have them. You bought a knife set, you got a great set, and as you use it, you want to, maybe now that you're cooking more, you want to expand your knife assortment. So what do you do? Well, you got two problems. One, the block happens to be made out of wood in most cases, and when you think about it, you take that knife, you clean it a little bit, and it's still got some residue on it, and you put it into the slot. Well, what happens in the slot? Does it miraculously disappear? No. It's probably one of the most germ-infested components in the kitchen. OK? So why would you use wood that only harbors <laughs> germs rather than create something that's antimicrobial? OK? That's one. Now, what about that? OK, so then they said, well, we'll put open air. We'll do that in open air. Well, how many of these? Are you going to run these across the whole wall in your kitchen? That doesn't work either, right? So that one wasn't there. Why not create a product that sits there and solves the problem? It's component that you can add to. It has open air so that it's cleaner, all right? And it's made from a microbial product mix that sits there and does. So fabric, whether it be content, whether it be material, there's so many ways to sit there and change the dynamic. It doesn't only have to be shape. It can be components that do as well. This is where we need to go. We need to start to rethink the equation. We need to, you know, help get beyond just the answers that the market has today. It's quickly about lifestyle marketing. 
all right? We've certainly changed the dynamic in how we live. Travel has now become the number one pastime for consumers. That's where they're spending their money, and that's the biggest growth area. We have areas that are growing that I haven't talked about in 15 years that are growing. Things like luggage, all right? Even steamers. We now, people are going out and buying portable steamers so they can steam their own clothes because they're traveling so much. And forgive me, but I have to say it, fanny packs. <laughs> fanny packs are back. And I can't believe I'm saying this in my lifetime, but here it is. All right, what's going on is we've got to recognize that these are the things that are happening. And here's one retailer who did a great job of taking travel and taking it out of a departmental mindset, meaning you went into a store and you normally would have to go to 13 different areas to get all these products that they put together. And they even brought in some of the sundry items like sunscreen and some of the other fun items. And they reaped tremendous success for this. Okay, so it's about understanding sometimes Thinking out of the box and getting more current with what's going on works. Here are the hot brands that are out there. Yeti cooler, you know, most of us need to go out and buy a cooler that's going to keep our ice cold for 24 days, right? But, you know, okay, if you need that, that's great. But they went out and created a wider range of product because it was based on the quality of their goods. All right? Adidas went out and said, we're not going to try to compete with Nike that way anymore. We're not going to just be about performance. We're going to be about lifestyle. And, you know, Bissell went out and said, okay, we're going to rethink the floor care business. We're not going to sell the old fancy, old, you know, floor polisher. We're going to go out and create a unit that is a vacuum, is a mop, is a floor care unit, has pet hair. I mean, this thing does like eight different things. All of a sudden now, this is what my wife wants for holiday gifts. I'm sitting going, wow, <laughs> amazing change. It's about real romantic to come home with one of those floor care machines. We'll see if I get in trouble or not. But it's all about understanding the numbers and understanding the differences between generations. Their needs are different. And it's about understanding how those dynamics play and what the message is and what you need to speak and how you need to speak it, different languages. So collision retail is really all about understanding when brands bump together, when product bumps together. It's about collating the assortment and curating it so that it's about understanding how to have the optimum mix. It's really about changing the dynamic in a huge way, all right? I'm looking out at the audience, a bunch of guys have, a, you know, some nice growth going on. You've got, you know, a few, well, probably about a third of the guys are, you know, sporting something that's going on there, right? Either you're really lazy and don't like to shave, or it looks good, right? But look at what's going on in the small appliance business, in personal care business, electric shavers, men's trimmers, hair dryers, hair clippers, electric shaver parts. All right? And heating pads. I guess you start to get some shoulder issues when you start to try to groom for an hour in front of the mirror. But it's really about understanding. This is where all those businesses have migrated to. That's lifestyle marketing. That's the change in how we have to dynamic. What do you think the most favorite brand of consumers is today? The most favorite, the most important brand? Yourself. You have now declared that you care more about what you do than the brands that you've bought in the past. You're not, when you think about it, everybody's out there taking a selfie. They're not showing the products that they're wearing from head to toe anymore. That used to do that. They used to talk about what they bought and how they bought it and why they bought it. Now it's where you are and how you're doing, right? You always got that goofy face. I don't, know, I don't know why, but we do. So it's about brand. The brands and retails have to know you better than you know you. And that's what you expect. You expect them to educate you. You expect them to help them save money. You expect them to tell you the story of what these products can do. It's about understanding all these different dynamics, exploring with them, diversifying their lifestyle and helping them understand more. It's about creating a product mix. Think, if you think I'm kidding, take a look at this. One of the new hot products in the beauty business is Fit Me. 30 different shades of foundation. And it's even called Fit Me. Me, okay? All right, third, you know, third love, about half sizes in the intimate apparel industry, you know, changing the dynamics so it fits better than any other product. It's about all about personalization and creating that. And we talked about the need for cookware, about doing it your way so that you can add to your collection. Basics maintain business. Innovation, newness is what drives growth. It's all about understanding how to take new product to get the consumer excited.
61% of people tell us they discover fashion. They want to discover new products, all right? Sometimes the brand goes back in time and brings a heritage product back. This was a consumer-born trend. This wasn't Adidas saying we're going to go make Adidas superstar a hot shoe. This was the consumer who found this again. But what Adidas did was they said, well, wait a minute. It's costing us too much money to make a 16-gram shoe. We're going to make it 9 grams, and we're going to reconstruct it, but it's going to still look the same. And it's about innovation and product and marketing and messaging, all these different components. It isn't just about product. It's about making the consumer feel as if you know, it goes beyond just convenience. It isn't just about getting it easily. It's about make my life better. That's what we're willing to invest in. That's what we need. We need to all understand how to do those things and do those things better. The changing face of the consumer. I don't have time to go into this, but you know, this is a huge shift in the dynamic. Look at the growth rates on some of these numbers. Multiracial is going to become a huge part of the growth market. All right? It's about understanding you know, how to sell product and how to achieve product and how to carry wider assortments with less product in stores. It's all about understanding that. It's about age playing a huge role. All right? It's also about gender playing a huge role in the workforce. This is actually women in the workforce by 2015. Look what happened. It started to decline in the, tw in the 2000s. All right? Let's fast forward to where we are now, and you can sit there and see, look at the, the green line is the female labor force. It's on the rise again, but yet brands and retailers aren't necessarily reacting to that. That blue line is the restaurant business. They aren't figuring out that they need to go back to women working again. They're not doing a good job of capturing it. And most brands are forgetting about it. In fact, I mentioned earlier about technology. They still live in the mindset of when 33% of women were buying technology. Well, it's now 51%, and they represent 52% of the population. So why wouldn't you start to add up the numbers and figure out how to market to the more important side of the equation. Guys, don't get mad at me, but women are doing more shopping and spending more products for us and for themselves than we are. So it's really about understanding the changes that need to occur. It's about the population shifts that are going on. If you do the numbers and you start to think about this, by 2025, the two big booms are going to be the millennial consumer and the boomer consumer. And as we look at the Gen Xs and Gen Z, we have to sit there and figure out how in the next four or five years are we going to get that dip to become growth. That's where the challenge comes from, folks. That's why you are so needed in helping the brands understand and the retailers understand how to get growth in a challenged market. I don't have time to really go into too much about this one, but it's really about we are now going to have over 11 homes in our adult lifetime. As a senior, as an elder person, you're going to have five. Assisted living, unassisted, whatever, all the different kinds of things are going on. So again, huge opportunities to understand the dynamics. And I'm going to quickly go through some of the biggest changes that are faced in front of us. Obviously, corporate accountability, sustainability in the broad sense. All right, whether it be women's wages, whether it be the workforce, whether it be accountability, whether it be the planet, whether it be recycle, whether it be all these different things. Temperatures are changing. Opportunities are changing. I'm not going to you know, go into but all these different industries have opportunities to tap into these dynamics that are changing. Learning how to use data in making more conscious and better business decisions is more paramount today than ever before. I work with some clients that they sit there and they go, well, why do I need to know this? Well, if you're living in certain areas or selling in certain markets, or selling to a large retailer who needs to understand those markets, there's huge opportunities that lay in front of us. All right? And we certainly have events that are happening in, this, in the world that are just feeding this frenzy even more so. All right? It's about social positions. It's about understanding the different dynamics. It's about, I mean, think about if you're in the NBA, how, you know, what a faux pas they created. All right? It's about understanding brands positioning being important. A third of consumers tell us it's extremely or very important. All right? Have you ever made a purchase based on social issues? Well, certainly yes. And look at the 18 to 34 year number. All right? It's about how, you know, how it's made. Does, you know, where is a product made makes a difference. How it's made makes a difference. All right? It's about everything starting to become a different part. Transparency and origin becoming more important. And we've been studying these numbers for decades. 
but they've never really scratched the surface in importance, and now all of a sudden they are. The time has come to change that. Labeling has to change, and you can see the importance here, all right? That, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot if they bought sustainable product, but we're starting to begin to see. You saw the numbers that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, all right? Localization, that matters, all right? How about value? You know, understanding what value is. People don't necessarily want to pay the lowest price, but they want to get the best value for their buck. So it's important for us to help them understand what does that mean and how do we do that? And how do you compete in a world where some people are trying to sell, you know, a blender for $5? All right? It's about understanding what do you do and how do you get there? Are you willing to pay more for sustainable product? The answer is yes, and even more so for the younger generation. Inventory free stores popping up, starting to show up. What does that mean and how do we get product to the consumer in a bigger, faster, better way? All right? New dynamics with buy online, pick up in store starting to shift and change. All right? Anybody, eat, anybody ever have an impossible burger? I'm afraid to try it. Is it, is, you survived? I guess you did, you're here. I'm, I'm, I know I'm gonna try it, but I gotta be at the right place at the right time, all right. It's about, think about this, it's about plants, you know, now for, or, you know, for butter, dairy, bu plant butter. I mean, we're looking at things that are changing all the time now. It's understanding those differences in innovation and fashion and technology and beauty and, and, and food, all these different elements. Are these things important? Sustainability, human rights, the number one thing that people tell us is the, the concern when it comes to the broad statement of sustainability. All right, how are products made, you know, make the clothes, make that, you know, the, all those different components becoming really critical. And the brands that have it built into their DNA are the ones that they can cite easily. So it isn't just about doing it, it's about sharing it and about really believing it and living it. And that's where we really have opportunity to be able to understand it. So all of these changes are where the world that, you know, you're about to enter into and the world that some of you are already in, we need to understand how to do that. We have to work together in figuring out how to do this. This is what is facing us. The biggest challenge in retail is changing the product so it mirrors what the consumer wants. Those are the opportunities that lie in front of us. So the future is really uh, right now. It's right here. You've got to grab it. These are all the things that we just talked about. I'm not suggesting by any means you do all of them. I'm suggesting you think about the ones that you feel you can contribute to or can help contribute for you and make it happen. This is a really great time to be in retail. This is a really great time to be building product and reaching the consumer. We are hungry for product. This holiday is going to be one of the trickiest holidays in retail that I've seen and I've been doing this for 40 years, okay? Why? Because there is nothing new. The lack of innovation has created the biggest challenge for retail, okay? It's really about what, if you think about it, the same hot products last year are gonna be the same hot products this year, and that's just because nothing has replaced it. So there's huge opportunity to be able to go out and take this industry and make it work. Retail has a huge bright future. I'm excited about it, and I'm really excited about where we are in the place that we have to do. So I wish you all the best of luck, thank you very much, and. Please, remember one thing. It's up to you. You have the ability to make these things change, make these things happen. And in concert with one another, we're going to build this industry better. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Marshall. At this point, I'd like to ask the panelists to please join me on stage. Watch your step. I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening. Julie Gugamos, who is the Senior Vice President of Own Brand Product Design and Management at Target, and Cece Lee, who is the Vice President of Revenue at Trendalytics. To kick this off, let's have each of you tell a little bit about yourself, your career history, and your background. I'll start. I'm Julie Gugamos, and I work at Target. 
I am the Senior Vice President of Brand Management and Product Design. And what that means is that I oversee the creation of our own brands and the design of the products um, that ladder up to our own brand portfolio. So today we have about 45 brands um, that represent 30% of Target's total sales volume and we design and create 25,000 unique products every year. Um, so I'm Cece. I'm the VP of Revenue at Trendalytics, and actually I started my career in retail at Target, in fact. So lived here a long time ago. Um, don't miss the winter, that's one thing. Um, and actually from there, I've worked at a variety of different companies, both from the retail and the wholesale side. Um, so from Target to Jimmy Choo to Michael Kors, um, and actually I left retail a couple of years back to come work at Trendalytics, uh, which is kind of a half step, I'd say, between fashion and tech. And so from a vertical expertise position, it's been um, a pretty easy transition, but tech is a crazy industry, I'll tell you that. I, I'm going to be real quick. I started my career while I was in pre-law school. I ended up working part-time at Bloomingdale's. And 15 years later, I left as a general merchandise manager um, and never became a lawyer. So uh, I got hooked on the retail industry, worked for manufacturers, designers, uh, thought I was going to retire at some point and, and did, but then decided that wasn't such a good idea at 40 years old. So I found this little opportunity to work for a company called NPD, which is this data company, and I've been there for the last 20 years. All right, I'm gonna kick us off with the first question, and I would like all three of us to answer it. And Marshall, we'll start with you. And the question is, how does predictive merchandising play into your daily job? <laughs> Every day I wake up thinking about what can I come up with that's new and different. I tell everyone that I work with, and every uh, retailer and brand that I engage in, I need to tell you something you don't know. I, need not to, I don't need to tell you what you already know, I need to tell you what you don't know. I need to look forward. I like to tell the story about where we're heading. It's easy to sit there and look in the rear view mirror, but the goal is to be able to recognize where is the consumer going, and where is the industry going, and where is the economy going. When you look at all those components, it gives you an opportunity to really help think and rethink the equation and build a better brand. So that's actually exactly what our company does, is effectively drawing out the trend curve from a data science and mathematical perspective uh, in order to tell people where trends are going based on its trajectory from a search, social, as well as e-com um, standpoint. And so it's, I mean, it is literally my full-time job is predictive analytics, so. <laughs> that's great. And um, we use Trendalytics all the time. It is the best tool. Yay. It, and, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but literally you can find out where any product sits from a social standpoint, how many people are posting it, how many people are searching it, and where it's showing up at retail mm -hmm. to help you predict uh, when you want to bring a new item in. It's amazing. <laughs> um, but I'm going to speak about the trend curve. We use the trend curve all of the time to understand where products or cultural trends fall to ensure we understand where the guests, or we call our consumer the guest, so if I use the word guest, that's why, but to understand where our guest um, adoption is a, a specific idea. Um, we look at cultural trends against the trend curve to understand when we might launch into a new category or launch a new brand, and we use the trend curve every day to understand where a product sits. And I think a lot of you know the trend curve, but it goes from testing to incoming, pre-peak, post-peak, and outgoing. And when you place an item um, on the trend curve, it will help you understand how deep you should buy it, what's the inventory investment. If it's on the front side, you can go big because sales are increasing at an increasing rate. If it's on the back side, you have to be careful because sales are decreasing at an increasing rate. And with that is your pricing and promotional strategy. If an item is on the front side, 
you can ask a little bit more retail for it because the demand is high. Once you flip over the curve, you need to be competitive in price and most likely you need to promote it more in order to move through the inventory. Um, so it's a great tool, we use it all the time and you know the magic comes in when you're looking at your full assortment and plotting it out against the trend curve because you don't wanna have too much that's on the incoming pre-peak because you'll never maximize the full potential of an item and if you have your assortment on the back side, you're gonna be having an inventory, slower turn, and many markdowns, so balance is the key. All right, Cece. Yes. I'm gonna jump into the next question. What do you feel is the largest opportunity for retail in coming years? So like Marshall was saying in his presentation, actually, I think the message that has to come across is that there's a ton of opportunity out there. Um, and when people are missing sales or feeling the crunch of uh, negative comps, it's not because people aren't buying things anymore. It's because they're trading into different things that you just may not understand the demand of at that point. Um, and so I really feel like it is for retailers, you have to kind of get away from the old ways that you've always done things. And I think that's something even at our company, you know, we're only five years old and you hear people all the time say, well, we've always done it that way. And there is no always. And that's a thing that I think retailers have to understand um, is everything is shifting. And if you don't, I, I used to always say this when I worked at Target actually is um, innovate or die. And that's truly the name of the game is you have to continue to push forward and challenge the conceptions that you have. Um, and I think it, this is a little contrived because people say this all the time, but you know, when people, big industry or big companies will say like, oh, we behave a little bit like a startup. And I think now having worked at an actual startup, nobody behaves like an actual startup. Um, but I think a little bit more of that mindset and saying, okay, just because we did this this way the last time does not necessarily mean we have to do it again this way the next time. Um, and being able to understand where you need to pick and choose your battles. I love that. And I think one of the most common mistakes in retail is doing what worked last year because you're only gonna get what you had last year. Um, so watch out for that. Um, I'm actually gonna take the next question um, because I'm the moderator, so I get to choose. And um, <laughs> this one is for the students in the, in the room, or to the students. Um, the question for me is, what is your one piece of advice for the students in our audience who are currently studying retail? So I thought about this, and you know, I could have mentioned in my introduction, I been in retail for almost 30 years. Half of my career was in uh, merchandising. I s had many different roles as um, inventory analyst to merchandise planner to buyer, um, so on and so forth, and the other half in product design. But the piece of advice that I would give you is be a student of your business and category. So once you graduate, it doesn't mean that you're done being a student. You have to be a student all the time. and. I mean, take it really seriously. Get out and understand the external environment. Know your competition. Know their assortment strategy, their promotional strategy. How often do they update their assortments? Um, <clears throat> what, how do they story tell? Um, what's the digital strategy? What's the retail architecture? Know every one of your comp competitors inside and out. And know your consumer. And there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, it can be done through observation. It can be done through interviews. But it is so important to understand how your consumer or your user lives, what their pain points are, what keeps them up at night, what they value, what's important to them. Um, because as you're creating your assortment strategy or designing an item, you will be able to deliver to the unique needs of your user. All right, um, a couple questions on external data. So these both will go over to you, Marshall. With the extensive amount of data at NPD's fingertips, how does your team narrow down to critical strategic insights? <laughs> <laughs> Every client that we have has a different appetite has a different cadence, has a different team, has a different ability to absorb. So it's really up to the team to number one, and you probably go through the same thing, and that is to deliver what they can absorb, but also to train, teach, and, 
and elevate their level of engagement so that they're constantly growing and evolving. Um, so I, I would sit there and say, the smallest piece of the pie is giving them what they know, and the bigger piece of the pie is educating them on how to grow. And because there is so much of an extensive amount of data, it's, it's interesting. I learn almost every day. We work collaboratively within our organization. We have teams of people. Um, and I'm fortunate that I get to work across so many different teams. And each one of those teams has their own idiosyncrasies. So it's really about understanding, just like you said, understand the consumer. We have to understand our customer, understand our retail partner, and understand what they need to do to get to where they have to go. So we have to be predictive. We have to be intuitive. And we also have to be investigative so that we can find the answers and make it believable. All right, so as a follow-up to that question, which, this is not a leading question, which retailer do you feel is leveraging data the best and why? <laughs> can I answer this in a way that clearly shows that I'm not trying to be biased? Yes. Okay. Recently, we worked on a project for a retailer where are you? You're over here. Okay. <laughs> Recently, we worked on a project that I'll, I'll give you the credit. Heather asked me a question. And it led to us looking at data in a way that we've never looked at before. And we were able to literally plot, and you know where I'm going with this, we were literally able to plot every single store location based on the assortment size, and I, I can't give away all the details here, but it was such an extensive new way of using. So I, my answer is, I would sit there and say my favorite piece of data and outcome was a project that we worked with on Target. And it literally could, just that one, one study alone can change the shape of the store, the assortment, the predictive planning, the allocation, so many components, just by being able to take data to another level. The other retailer I would sit there and say that's very data savvy would be someone else in this neighborhood, would be an electronic retail Best Buy is another good one, who understands how to take understanding the consumer to a new level. I mean, if you look at their ability to be able to keep adding dynamic categories to their mix and successful at it is because of data usage. All right, shifting gears back to CC. Tell us a little bit about Trendalytics. What services does Trendalytics provide to retailers and companies that support retailers? I don't think I can say it better than you did, okay. uh, to be clear. <laughs> but I will say that uh, essentially what we're trying to do is help people understand what's going on outside of their four walls. Um, so especially working in retail, everyone who works in retail knows this, is you spend hours a day, every day, analyzing your own business, right? And so especially when business is good, that's when you should be doubling down and working that much harder. However, I think once people exit their proverbial literal, figurative four walls, um, they have a, a really hard time understanding what they should be doing. And so I think really what we're trying to do is harness the amount of data that's available, which is this, right, my arms cannot go wide enough, um, into packets of information that people can understand. Um, because at the end of the day, to Marshall's point, there's so much data out there, but if you have no idea what to do with it, you can't do anything with it. So essentially what we're trying to do is distill that into something that you can use to, in order to make better decisions. So just to give an example, um, when Br Brett's were on the runway, we immediately um, used Trendalytics to understand the social activity, and it was immediate. And soon after, people were searching for it, um, at which point we're designing barrettes and putting plans into place to bring them in. <laughs> and literally by the time we you know, put the orders in the system, we could see the you know, barrettes as a category start to increase throughout retail. So it starts at the boutiques and then it moves through specialty and then department stores. So it's just an incredible tool. And the idea for us is not to wait until it gets all the way through. Like we wanna catch it when we see the activity post runway, right in that social, um, Sweet to spot. search, yeah, sweet spot. And then it's fun to compare different items to see like, okay, the barrette, you know, um, data 
looked like this, how did that compare to the belted pant or the velvet dress or the tiered dress? Um, so you can start to get an understanding of how big an idea will be. Well, and just as a small aside to that, there's a couple of uh, girls in our office actually who stack every single trend, and it's an interesting personal shopping application, but um, one of the girls came in the other day in literally a PVC leather coat, biker shorts, and multiple pearl barrettes, and I was like, I don't even know how you can stack so many trends in one place, but it is, it's definitely not cool enough for that. <laughs> All right, another question for you, Cece. Uh, for the students in the room that are soon to enter the retail industry, please describe your experience working for larger corporations like Target or Michael Kors to relatively tech startup or small tech startup like Trendalytics. Uh, I think the best piece of advice I can give is learn as much as you can. Um, I think it is, it's, you have to be ready to work in a startup, I'll say that, and I don't think anyone really knows what that means until you actually get there. Um, here's a small example. So we're actually a lot smaller than anyone thinks we are, which is funny. Um, but when I first started, I was doing accounts receivable as well as account management and also some sales. And actually on various occasions, um, I was also being the office manager. And so these are things that I think you don't need to do necessarily in a big corporation. In a big corporation, it is a little bit, not all the time, but there is a little bit of a set path, right? There's a training program, you understand what your job is. There are lots of people who are doing a job that is very similar to yours. Um, and I think the best piece of advice I can give you is learn everything everywhere because everyone's got something to bring to the table. And I think that was um, the best thing I did for my career was ask everybody questions, try to understand every single person that I work with. Um, because especially on my side now, it's been uh, a huge benefit for me to know wholesale, retail, manufacturers, vendors, off price, and it's just learn everything that you can. Thank you. All right, um, we're wrapping up toward the end. How are we doing on time, Peggy? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Well, I'll talk very slowly then on this one. Um, how, uh, the question is um, for me, and it is how does Target, and you guys can answer it too if you want, um, how does Target merge the science of data with the art of commerce? Um, and I love this question, right? Because we, we spent a lot of time talking about data. Marshall, you talked about so much data in the beginning, how data informs innovation. We talked about how it informs our consumer wants and needs. We talked about data helping us understand where trends are going. Um, we work with NPD all the time to understand white space opportunities, where our categories might be under index or have room to grow. Data is so important to what we do, and it points us to where we're going. And I want to reemphasize, it points to where you're going, not where you've been. If you use, late, if you use past data, you're only going to be as good as last year. Even if it was a great year, don't be tempted, like continue to look forward and let the data guide you. But that's only half of the equation. The magic of retail comes into the art of merchandising and that is um, both physical experience and digital experience. And when I was thinking about what makes up, you know, the, the experience, what's the magic, I thought about a couple of, th a couple of things. One is around curating choice. There are so many products out in the industry. There, there's so much competition that if you're a buyer or if you're a designer designing a, a new item, do the heavy lifting for the consumer. And what I mean by that is understand what's available, understand what they need, and find the best product. The best product that delivers the right attributes, that's beautifully designed, that's trend right, and offer it at the best value. In other words, what you get for the price is unbeatable and unmatchable. That's, that's, you know, I call it careful curation of choice. If you do the hard work for your consumer, you're gonna build that trust and they'll come to you time and time again. So that's one. Second, I think about abundance. If you have courage and have the belief in an item or a new trend or an idea and you go big and you bulk it out, your consumer will believe in it too. If you don't take that leap of faith on a trend 
or an important item and you just put a couple in the store, they're going to miss it. So if you build it, like we always say, if you build it, they will come. So remember that. And then third, storytelling. And storytelling is such an important part because it engages the consumer. It creates emotional connections. And I was reflecting on a trip to London that we had last month and we were in Topshop. And right when you come into the door, there were maybe 12 mannequins. And every single one had on either a tiered dress or a long tiered skirt with a chunky sweater. And everybody had a booty on. And the booties were a little bit higher than where we've been wearing them. Um, and it's to accommodate where the skirt and dresses are following. But you knew right then and there that the most important trend offered by Top, Top Shop were tiered dresses, tiered skirts, chunky sweaters, and booties. And that's being declarative, and it's that element of storytelling. You can also engage by helping your consumer, your guest, understand how something could play out in their home. And I was thinking of Hearth and Hand. It's a brand that we have a target, and we have a framework of a house um, that carries the brand inside. And right when you walk in, we have a vignette that showcases how you could decorate your front door with a doormat, some beautiful lanterns, wreaths. And I love that display, and the product sells like this. We need to buy more, <laughs> because every time I walk by, it's almost sold out. But it's because we're showing our guests how she can make that look come to life in her home. And I also think about emotional connection and experiences and helping your consumer think about memories and family. You know, you've ever gone to Williams-Sonoma, and they've got the baking, you know, might be holiday baking, and they've got aprons for the parents and aprons for the kids and the really cute little cookie cutters and sprinkles of, you know, every color and shape that you can imagine, and there's kits for the dough. And all of a sudden, you can see yourself sitting at the, you know, kitchen island with your kids making cookies, so you're buying into that idea. Like, that's storytelling. So, in summary, storytelling, abundance, curation of choice, um, that is the art of merchandising, and it goes hand in hand with data. I think, yeah, from my perspective, actually, we think about it from a slightly more, mm -hmm. because our product is a platform, and people don't get that emotional about something, just like a, a SaaS platform. Um, I, think I do. Yeah, you do, <laughs> which, great, you're best cheerleader. Um, but I think what we think about a lot is um, the best buyers that you know are the people who are really good at pattern recognition, right? So they, for whatever reason, your brain is the best computer, right? So your brain is number one, the best processor and the best computer. And so it's how do we feed you the right kind of data as opposed to just every single piece of data that's out there. Um, and so I think from a pattern recognition perspective, it is how can we help every single person be as good at pattern recognition as your best buyers, right? And so if you think about all the things that you were just saying, those are things that your best buyers will just naturally understand because of the years of experience that they have and the right decisions that they've made and things that they've seen as success. So you take that piece of knowledge as, a, as one data point and that's how you make your decisions in the future. And so that's really what we're trying to do is help everyone, even if you don't have the emotional connection or all the data points, understand how to put that into practice. That's great. Earlier, just before we went on, I was sitting there thinking about how we could package this conversation. And I looked over there and I saw that little letter I. And I wrote down three th words. Innovate, integrate, and initiate. And I realized there's my theme for my next two months. <laughs> but it, it's really about recognizing it is about innovation. And it, it is about newness. We, we've all mentioned it. We've all talked about looking forward to figuring out how to do that. It, it is about integrating with the needs to be able to communicate what it is, to your point, storytelling. I can't tell you how critical and important that is. That's what made the internet so successful in commerce, was the ability to tell a story. But that's only with you know, a one-dimensional piece. So the, the store itself adds the three dimensions, and now soon can add a fourth. Uh, and then initiate means got to go out and do it, got to go out and think about it, got to go out and make it happen. And, and that's where I find most brands and retailers get stuck. Mm -hmm. they, the fear factor, you guys are very different. You guys go out and love to take 
on a risk, take on a challenge. You're probably one of the most progressive retailers out there that does that. I don't know many retailers that would sit there and say, well, let's go out and find a partnership with you know, a designer and go make a big hoopla out of it. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, OK. I mean, you find a way to make it really happen and, and make it great no matter what. So those are the three things that I thought about today that if you just had to package it in a little you know, word blurb, that would be it. That's great. Catchy. Thank you both. We're going to take a break and hand it over to Heather, is that right, for Table Talk. And so then we'll come back. First of all, everybody, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this very insightful conversation. So as Julie mentioned, we're going to take about a 10 minute break to do Table Talk. So this discussion will happen at your tables, and it's to explore key takeaways. After we do this, we're actually going to have microphones throughout the room, and the panelists are going to be answering questions um, that you have either for them or as it relates to the overall um, presentation, or again, just any questions that you have for them. So talk at your tables, take the next 10 minutes, and we'll come back. So we're going to take about the next 10 minutes for questions from the audience. There are two people with microphones. So we'll raise your hand and the microphones will be brought to you for questions that you can ask our panel. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, first, I want to just commend, we're sitting with four freshman students from a retail merchandising pr uh, pr uh, program. And the robust discussion we've had at our table for the last 15 minutes has been incredible. So the future of retailing is bright uh, as, I, <laughs> as I look here. Um, one of the questions that we had is, could the panel talk about what trends you're seeing in fulfillment? We talked a lot about Target and Shipped, uh, which was really exciting. And then maybe if you could relate that a little bit, not only the trends in fulfillment, but to the Generation Z, which we have heavily represented here in the room. <laughs> yeah, I don't want it. You want it. Okay. Uh, the game has changed. Uh, and we live in a world today where buy it today, have it tomorrow is expected. Uh, progressive retailers have figured out how to either partner with someone or go out and invest in businesses that are going to fulfill product in many different ways, whether it be get the product to the store and on the shelves, whether it be get the product from the store to you, whether it be concierge services, um, and you can see the benefits that are, are, are coming from those. Uh, it, it's interesting to sit there and see how Amazon, which clearly is using next day delivery at a loss to separate themselves and raise the bar to everybody else, um, and everybody feeling the pressure. Uh, so as we watch the consumer engage and get used to this paradigm, um, and we, we certainly see the Gen Zs that grew up with a computer in their crib, uh, it's going to be expected. Uh, it's also going to be something that it doesn't necessarily mean the store has to have everything in stock. It means that we just have to get it to you really quickly. And in the buy now, wear now, use now mentality, it becomes even more important. So this is a trend that's just going to continue to evolve. The only thing I would add is it will be interesting to see how Gen Z and future generations start to think about sustainability and how that might um, conflict with all the cardboard and deliveries that come you know, to America's homes every single day. So it'll be interesting. I, it, there, there could be an uptick in store pickup or else a different type of delivery system where the container which houses the items, you know, is sent back um, and be repurposed. So I was actually going to talk about the exact same thing from the other side is um, it is a really interesting thing because the, the way that we live our lives right now is that you want it immediately, and if you get it tomorrow, you're also annoyed because it's not there today. And so actually, in New York, obviously, we use Prime Now a ton, and so that's even the two-hour delivery windows. I'm like, 
oh God, why isn't it coming in one hour? But it is truly um, going to have to change because I actually see even just anecdotally, um, all of my friends, for example, will now only do one prime order a week, theoretically, and you want to get everything done because the cardboard waste is astronomical. And in New York, you see the boxes on the sidewalk, which our sidewalks are like a third of the size of yours. Um, and so when you see the boxes stacked up and you walk by it all the time, it is a thing that you have to think about on the other side. And so I do think actually um, there's gonna be a backlash in the same way that there's a backlash to fast fashion. Um, but how quickly it'll come and how much people want to put their money where their mouth is, is a question mark because you also just want it immediately. So I do think that you're going to have to see, um, I was actually just reading an article um, in Nat Geo about uh, the innovation in the cardboard space, which is the least sexy headline you've ever heard. Um, however, it is an industry that is, to use a tech term, ripe for disruption. But, you know, it, it does have to change because people want things immediately, but you don't want something immediately that's going to end up in a landfill immediately afterwards. Awesome. Next question. How do you track uh, lost opportunities? I'm thinking particularly of um, physical stores. A lot of um, my retail backgrounds in food. And a lot of food stores at this point are putting um, pumpkin spice and everything in their lobbies and actually losing customers who either can't or don't want to walk through um, the aroma or the fragrance. How do you track that? I mean, how, because I was talking to a, um, one of the chains and they said, well, you know, we're not getting as much traffic as we want and those things don't sell. And I was wondering, is there a way to track how you lose people? We, we have heat maps, so we um, have technology that watches um, the consumer shopping pattern through the store, how long they linger in the aisle, how many people. Um, but what if they don't even get in your store? I mean, what if you lose them to other stores that don't have, say, a fragrance mm. or, or something? The only way you can really capture that is through the NPD data. We call that leakage. I mean, we can see where we lose share and who's picking it up. Oh, um, okay. And you can drill pretty far down within the category and get specifics. Yeah, one of the things I always like to look at is not what your strength is, but what your missed opportunities are. Um, so if you're in a particular industry and you're strong in some, that's great. Do what you need to do to protect that but the opportunity for growth is gonna come from where you're falling behind the competition or the unanswered space. Sometimes it's something that nobody's doing or another industry is doing that you can do. Um, and that, that's gonna be the big future is going to be, if you look at how many industries, how many businesses have been spawned from outside of the industry. So my favorite example is, why did the tech companies let outside companies take cell phone cases and make that their business. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you, if you were a tech company, be in the cell phone case business? It's only logical, but they didn't do it. So there are all these different businesses that, that are spawned from outside that are attacking and infiltrating. The athletic shoe business is a really good example of how outside businesses have come in and taken the space. I think so. another smaller thing that you can do to track that kind of missed opportunity, sometimes there's no data point, um, but other times when people are mad, what do they do? They go to Twitter, right? And so you can do sentiment analysis on people's commentary as well, because if you left because of the overwhelming aroma of pumpkin spice, for example, you probably complained about it to somebody. Um, and obviously, Apple is always listening to you, and so is Facebook. And so I assume that there is also somebody crunching those numbers to say, sentiment has shifted on pumpkin spice, nix the pumpkin spice. And it's about utilizing that information as well. Awesome. All right, we have time for one more question. This the smart student there, be careful. <laughs> Use it over. So, so I just had a quick question. You guys talk about data a lot. So lately there's been like uh, a big push for or against globalization, reshoring, and like domestic manufacturing. With people wanting new products and innovative products, but they want it tomorrow, what does the data look like as, and then obviously the political climate, what does the data look like as far as like 
the next two years, the next 18 months, like, will we see a lot more reshoring and supply chain and operations focus, or are we going to see, like, domestic focus on manufacturing? Having been a manufacturer that was in a domestic production that then ended up getting moved offshore and then trying to bring it back onshore, because I liked way back when and made in USA was a, a big trend, we tried to bring it back. Those factories are gone. While I would love the politicians to be right in saying we want to onshore a lot of the production, it's going to take years to get these factories up and running. You just can't sit there and say, okay, we're going to now manufacture all these cars in the U.S. if we don't have those factories there. It takes time to, to tool it. It's not Amazon building a warehouse. This is building a production chain. And for manufacturers, it's a very expensive proposition to buy all that equipment. I mean, manufacturing companies have a substantial investment in those machines. Uh, it's not going to happen as quickly as we would like, but it is starting to happen. And once it starts, which it has, you'll start to see that continue to grow and go. Uh, the reason why is they're beginning to learn the benefits and cost benefits, particularly with the fear of the tariff issues that got out there and all that, all the political nature of what was going on, the fear factor changed a lot of people's decisions to say, you know what, maybe I should make a little less money, but I'm in control. So you're going to see that start to accelerate, but it will take years. It's not going to happen overnight. Great. Well, you guys, we're running out of time. So one last round of applause for the panel. Thank you. Now, as we wrap up our evening, I would like to introduce Peggy Lord, the Assistant Director for our new Center for Retail Design and Innovation to give a few closing remarks. Thank you, Heather, and nice job tonight, thank you. Um, as Carol mentioned earlier this evening, I'm very excited to announce that we have opened our Center for Retail Design and Innovation in McNeil Hall on the St. Paul campus. The CRDI has been a two-year journey of brainstorming, benchmarking, and concept development that now has a strategic mission and industry partners to bring real-world hands-on experience to our students in a very meaningful way. We partnered with an interior design student to create our collaborative meeting and working spaces and worked with our graphic designer and communications team to create our website. So make sure you check it out and the website address is up on the screen. We are honored to have Macy's and Decor as two of our first industry partners. Macy's is working on a case study with Professor Jay Thompson's uh, Consumers of Design course. Students will partner with Macy's style crew to perform a strategic analysis and evaluation of their current social media strategy, examining their current content and platforms to make recommendations to take their social media to the next level. Students are midway through the research phase and are working in groups to develop their proposals with a final presentation to Macy's executives in early December. We are looking for additional industry partners to work with us on this exciting initiative. This is an opportunity for you to greatly impact the education of our future retail leaders and gain insight into your business through research, case studies, focus groups, as well as establish connections into the College of Design. Please reach out to me if you would like to learn more about it or are interested in becoming a partner. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's been great to see so many people here. This is our, one of our um, biggest events yet and great to see so many familiar faces here and companies represented um, throughout the Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, and surrounding areas. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed your evening. Um, we're inspired by our speakers and we're also to, able to make some new con connections tonight. Thanks again and good night.